Hello, I'm Frank Sesno in Washington for the Hospice Foundation of America, and I want you to meet some very important people. I'm Elaine Kerchewski, and I'm a hospice volunteer in Chicago, Illinois. Hi, I'm Daniel Lee. Everyone calls me Juno, and I'm a hospice volunteer in Clearwater, Florida. I'm Gail Cherichek, and I'm a hospice volunteer in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Hi, my name is Alex Silva, and I manage hospice volunteers in San Diego, California. Those four individuals are part of a growing number of people all across America, more than 63 million strong, who make sure they find time to help others. Remember back in history class, we learned that our nation was born of volunteers. General George Washington led the original Continental Army that was comprised of colonialists who volunteered to fight the Revolutionary War. And so began a tradition of volunteering that continues today. According to the Corporation for National and Community Service, a federal agency that compiles data and tracks trends in volunteering, the tens of millions of Americans who volunteer each year generally do so to raise funds or help provide various services. Today, we'll learn about one very special kind of volunteer opportunity for hospice. You know, when we're with friends and our social events and they ask about hospice and what I do, their reaction is strange and negative and they're concerned about me being depressed and it being depressing and upsetting and they just don't know what hospice is. Well, before we talk about all that hospice is, let me tell you what hospice isn't. Hospice isn't a place where people go to die. Actually, hospice is about living. Hospice is medical care that focuses on quality of life by managing the physical pain and symptoms of the patient and the emotional and often spiritual pain of the patient and his or her loved ones. The goal of hospice care is for people with a life-limiting illness to spend their last months at home if they choose, among loved ones, as comfortable as possible. Hospice is unique in healthcare today because the care comes to the patient wherever he or she resides, including private homes and apartments, assisted living facilities and nursing homes. Sometimes hospice services begin while the patient is waiting to be discharged from a hospital. The modern day hospice movement came to the United States in the early 1970s. The first hospice established in the U.S. is in Connecticut. It was founded by volunteers, as were most of the hospice programs that followed. Today, there are about 5,000 hospice programs across the United States. Most are community-based nonprofits. Some are for-profit businesses. But either way, one thing the vast majority of hospice programs have in common is that they receive funds from Medicare, the federal health insurance program. In fact, Medicare is the main source of revenue for many hospices. But in order to receive funds from Medicare, a hospice must do certain things one of which is to utilize volunteers at least some of the time. As a teen volunteer, I basically go to a patient's home um, either for just talking or just celebrating a birthday party for them because everyone loves a birthday party and actually a lot of patients tell me that it's their first birthday party and yeah, lots of times I just go there, talk, so. see how they are and I just hear the most exciting life stories because these people have lived a long time and they kind of impart their knowledge on what they've seen throughout their whole life onto me and it's just it's fun for me and it's probably very relieving for them to kind of just have someone that someone different to talk to. Volunteers may also help by running errands, driving the patient to and from appointments, pretty much anything that will make the patient more comfortable and lighten the load on the caregiver. But not all hospice volunteers are directly involved in patient care. Some volunteers do crafts, like sewing a memory bear from the clothing of a family's loved one. That's then given to the family. Or they volunteer at a hospice's thrift shop, which sells things like furniture or clothing that have been donated in good condition. As a volunteer for my hospice, I work primarily on maintaining the website, getting out new information about events. I work with the marketing people who are designing brochures to make sure the information is consistent and that we're getting out a really great message to the public and that we're presenting a good image to our clients who might want to use our services. Hospices are often on the lookout for people with special skills and training, like notaries, beauticians and barbers, massage therapists, handlers of therapy animals, and providers of complementary or alternative therapies like healing touch 
aromatherapy, and music therapy. And hospice grief camps for children, many of which are offered at no cost to the participants, rely on volunteers. In fact, many hospices use volunteers to check in with loved ones by telephone, periodically for about a year, following a patient's death. Many hospices also provide students with an opportunity to fulfill community service requirements. Student social workers, nurses, and other aspiring professionals often volunteer to get a feel for the end-of-life care part of the healthcare continuum. Thank you so much for coming in. Please have a seat. Thank you. When someone lets us know that they're considering becoming a hospice volunteer, the first thing I do is thank them. People have so much on their plates these days that we're really thankful when they choose hospice as a way to spend some of their precious leisure time. When someone's considering becoming a hospice volunteer, they'll often ask, what will my time commitment be? What happens once I've applied to be a volunteer? Will I be trained? What happens if this turns out to be harder than I thought? While we can't answer for every one of the nation's hospices, we can give you some idea of what to expect. I spend about two to four hours a week with my hospice activities, and I might spend the whole time with the person because they need someone just to be with them. Other times it might just be 15 minutes because they're tired, they need to rest, and they don't want me right then. And that's okay because it's about them. But everything that I do with a patient, every time, it is documented. The reports filed by the volunteers are absolutely essential for a number of reasons. For one, we're required by Medicare to document that at least 5% of our total patient care hours are delivered by volunteers. The volunteer report helps complete the whole picture and allows us to see how the patient and or caregiver is doing. And the report helps me assess how the volunteer is doing in terms of both skills and attitude. The volunteer's report also documents compliance with the number and frequency of volunteer visits specified in the patient's individual care plan. If you think being a hospice volunteer sounds like a big responsibility, you're right. That's why hospices go to such great lengths to make sure an applicant is a good fit. I got on their website and found out who to call. I called and made an appointment for an in-person interview, came in for the interview and was given a packet with an application to fill out as well as an application for a background and investigation, uh, forms to fill out about patient confidentiality and the rules of the hospice. Forms are only half of the process. I meet with prospective volunteers for about an hour. It's not like a job interview. It's more like an informal conversation that allows me to get to know the person. I look to see whether the volunteer is receptive to the hospice philosophy and if they have some degree of comfort being around death and loss. I'm assessing the volunteer's maturity and whether they seem to be healthy emotionally. Do they have a strong religious, cultural, or ethnic bias that could be problematic? I ask about their motivation to be a volunteer and about their schedule, how often they're available and for how much time, and whether the applicant has a significant loss in his or her own life. If the applicant has had a recent loss, I need to determine whether the applicant should wait a little longer before becoming a hospice volunteer. The process from application to acceptance may take a little time, but each step is important to assure the relationship between the volunteer and the hospice is mutually beneficial. Once the interview, background check, and other requirements are complete, hospice volunteers receive plenty of training before being okay to see patients. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, welcome. Thank you all so much for coming in and volunteering for hospice. Orientation is the time where we not only learn how to spend time with patients, but we learn from other team members as to what their role is and to how we can fit in and blend with that. So. When I was there, we did it multiple evenings for several weeks. Um, I know now they'll do it in a weekend, but the point is, is that we learn how to interact with our team members as well as the patient. So we like believe training is crucial to, uh, to providing the best possible care to uh, patients and families. And, and when someone is properly trained, they can perform their duties with confidence. All volunteers are given a comprehensive orientation about hospice philosophy, the team approach to providing care, hospice regulations and policies, ethics and privacy regulations. 
We also talk about how the patient's terminal illness affects the rest of the household, spiritual care, and grief counseling services. Federal guidelines require the hospice to provide volunteers with additional training for specific tasks not covered in orientation should such needs arise. And hospices are required to provide ongoing education for volunteers to maintain their skills and learn new ones. And you get into your garden at all? Uh, yes, yes. In fact, uh, I help out in the building with the flowers. After orientation, I felt very comfortable and very competent to talk and spend the time with my hospice patients. But then you wonder, oh my God, what if they ask something that I can't answer? Where do I go from there? We teach new volunteers that hospice care is comprehensive and designed to meet each patient's individual needs. In order to do that well, care is delivered by an interdisciplinary team of which the volunteer is a very important part. Each team member represents a different discipline and brings different skills to the table. For example, hospice physicians have advanced training in controlling pain and managing other symptoms in people living with advanced illness. But the real expertise is in their ability to provide pain management that eases suffering while honoring the patient's wishes to remain as conscious, active, and independent as they choose. The hospice nurse usually coordinates the care with the patient, loved ones, and other hospice team members. The nurse also plays a pivotal role in communicating with other team members about the patient's needs. The hospice social worker provides counseling and mediation of patient and family conflicts, assisting in navigating the healthcare system and identifies community resources to address things like financial concerns. The hospice chaplain helps patients find their own answers to spiritual questions. Since spirituality is personal and individual, hospice chaplains are committed to honoring each person's belief, not imposing their own. The hospice home health aide, who sometimes is called the certified nursing assistant, generally is the team member the patient sees most often. The aide provides invaluable, practical assistance to patients with tasks of daily living, such as bathing and grooming. The aide can also assist caregivers with light housekeeping, meal preparation, and feeding the patient. And trained, compassionate hospice volunteers offer companionship to patients and occasional respite for loved ones. Volunteers make it possible for caregivers to run errands or simply take a break, which is invaluable to the caregiver. Although the patient benefits from the collective expertise of the team, so too does the volunteer. Other team members are always available for information or moral support. So I'd like to invite Angela up to come and receive your certificate of completion. Right. Thank you so, so much and Thank welcome. You. After demonstrating an understanding of the material presented in orientation, the volunteer is ready to do his or her job. But the work of the volunteer's supervisor, often the same person who interviewed the volunteer at the beginning of the process, is far from done. Once the volunteer comes aboard, it's up to the manager to make sure they remain aboard. At my hospice, our retention efforts focus on four areas. Supervision. I make sure the volunteer has a clear understanding of what's expected. I deal with their concerns or mine in a timely and professional manner. Communication. I encourage volunteers to ask me questions and make suggestions. I make sure they know their ideas are valued. Recognition. When my volunteer does a good job, I want him or her to know it. In fact, I want everyone to know it. Our hospice has a formal recognition program for volunteers as well as staff, and I make good use of it. And appreciation, which I see as a personal expression of thanks to the volunteer. Sometimes I say a few words privately, sometimes I send a short note or a greeting card, and sometimes I have the great pleasure of sharing a note that we've received from a grateful family. All of which adds up to a volunteer likely to remain a part of the organization. But there's really only one way to know what makes someone volunteer for hospice, and that is to ask. I started out as a hospice volunteer because hospice took care of my grandfather, and I saw the care and compassion that they offered and the great relief that the volunteers offered to my family, and I wanted to be a part of that. Hospice is one of the most rewarding experiences, maybe perhaps in my whole life, because you're just, you know that you're making a difference in that patient's life even though it might be for 30 minutes, for an hour, for a week, you just, you know that that patient has happiness for those couple, the, the, those moments you spend with them. I get a lot of satisfaction 
volunteering here because I can use the skills that I have to really make a difference for hospice patients and families and for this organization. I know I have made a difference, at least in one person's life at this point. And I know it's toward the end of their life, but that makes it all more important. If you are interested in volunteering, doing something important, making a difference in someone's life, contact your local hospice or go to hospicefoundation.org to find hospices in your area. I'm Frank Sesno in Washington for the Hospice Foundation of America. Thanks very much for watching.